I want to share with you this evening some advice that, that I've accumulated over many years in business, 40 years that I've been in business, that I, I think is particularly relevant, though, for the strange, or at least the unusual circumstances we find ourselves in in the UK. Uh, before Brexit, things were continuing, there were graphs went up, graphs went down, graphs have stayed about the same, but life was pretty predictable, and we could cope with uncertainty. If you think about how we survived the banking crisis, uh, I mean globally, but particularly in the UK, it was awful, but, the, but things were pretty much the same on Monday as they've been on Sunday and Tuesday, etc. And they may well be the same in three or four years' time as they are today, but we don't know. But what we do know is, and, and we will know, and, as the, and that's not a political point, as things unfold, we'll get better and better understanding. What we, what we do know, for absolute certainty, is the, the industrial environment in which we all operate today, the business environment we operate in today, is fundamentally different from the one that certainly my generation grew up in. And it's fundamentally different, not because of Brexit, not because of politics, not because of those sorts of things, but because of technology. And technology is changing everything that we do, Ian just mentioned the negatives of the, of the weekend and the, and the uh, cyber attack, but <clears throat> the global cyber attack, but it's changing the nature of absolutely everything that we do. And in, and in so doing, it's forcing us to think differently about the nature of business. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm of a generation, I was born in the 1950s, I, I, I was born precise, not in the general 1950s, I was born in 1951 to be precise, towards the end of it, for those of you who think I look really old, but anyway, I was born in 1951, and by the time I got to go to work, it was, it was obvious what you did. You found a really good job if you possibly could, and then you stayed in that job until you retired. And it, and it was the normal thing. And somebody, I went to work for IBM, and anybody who left IBM in the, in the years that I worked for them to go and, for example, start their own business, were considered to be crooks. It was obvious there's something dodgy about you if you went off to start your own business when you could have stayed at IBM for another 20-something years. And that was a normal thinking. And, pa and parents had nervous breakdowns when their children said, I'm thinking of starting my own business. Except almost no children ever said that, and so very few parents had nervous breakdowns. Whereas now, as we saw in the newspapers last week, before the cyber attack, those young men, Cambridge graduates, five years is out, outside of university, just raised half a billion dollars for their business, which is a, an operating system for virtual reality. So they've got a product that doesn't even work yet, they're still working on, and the thing that they've got is worth a billion, because they sold half of it for half a billion. Now, and for those of you who are not very good at maths, that was quite easy to do. I, I, it's going to get more complicated in a moment. So the business is, worth, is now worth a billion, and they've got half a billion in the bank, and they are going to produce whatever an operating system for virtual reality is and means. Those of you who are accountants in the room will have, di or no accountants, or are children of accountants, or are prepared to confess that you're accountants, will know actually it's quite hard to work out how do they get to work out, to calculate that that was worth a billion, apart from doubling half a billion by two. But how do they get to that bit when somebody said I put half a billion in? Because again, when I started out in business, the way you valued a business was you looked at its assets, and you said, that's the value of the business. And then when somebody paid a bit more for it, you called that goodwill, which you sniggered about and wrote off really quickly, because it was, it was actually, you'd, you'd seen them coming, and you managed to slide it by them. And now, people are prepared to pay half a billion dollars to buy half of a business, which hasn't actually got anything that they can sell at the moment. So if someone has valued those assets, theoretically, at a billion, but they can't have done, because it doesn't work yet. So things are topsy-turvy compared to my generation, of the way we were brought up. Looking around, I see some very young people here, and they're all going, yeah, get on with it, get on with it. That's, the, you're all, that's interesting how you used to deal with the steam and the coal era, but things have moved on. What goes with this moving on, though, is not just the way that valuations change, and I'm going to give you a bit of an insight into the answer about why is it worth a billion, and let you have your own method for going and perhaps applying that elsewhere, but the behaviors have changed. So great business leaders today are of two, ki two kinds. There are what I will pejoratively call the stuffed suits, who look the same, talk the same, they're interviewed on the radio or the television, they say the same things, they've been trained by the same people, they've had McKinsey do their uh, uh, strategy work, and so they think the same way, and they all look broadly similar. And not only do they look similar, but they move from company to company to company, as it were, as a cloud of people just moving around running something. So he's now chief executive of this, but he was chief executive of that. He did an okay job there, and he's going to do an okay job here, and everybody is fine. And he now sits on the comp committee of this bloke, who sits on his comp committee, and that whole world just continues. And there's another group of people creating wealth who aren't like that at all. And, and my hero at the moment is a man you'll all have heard of called Elon Musk. 
And Elon Musk is the man who, amongst many things, started PayPal, which you, with which you'll all be familiar. He also started Tesla. He also started SpaceX. Tesla is the electric motor car company. And SpaceX is his attempt to achieve his ambition, which is to populate Mars. Now, I know that when he raised the money for PayPal from venture capitalists, he didn't say, actually, I see this as a step towards populating Mars, because he probably wouldn't have raised any money at all when he did that. So he kept that bit secret, but he went and raised enough money to get PayPal started. He even became a billionaire as a result of that. He's reinvested these billions in several companies of his own, of which the two I mentioned are two. So he's running a large organization, several large organizations, but he isn't one of those people I was just so rude about. Jeff Bezos, who runs Amazon, looks like a stuffed suit. He's next uh, a Goldman Sachs. But you know what? He's created the world's most stonking retail business. It's so stonking that two years ago, Walmart, which used to be the world's most stonking retail business, issued a profit warning, and they blamed Amazon. Amazon is now, has, now has a market cap, a value in the marketplace, twice the size of Walmart. For a long time in Amazon's career, people said, well, they don't make any money, you know. <laughs> it, that won't last, they don't make any money, it doesn't really matter, it's not important, it's just online, online's part of the offering, you know, we've got bricks and mortar, etc., etc. Now they're worth twice as much as Walmart, and they make lots of money. And they will continue to make lots of money, and more and more money, and Walmart will make less and less money, and John Lewis will make less and less money, and, 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 until they get their act together, and then they may be able to fight back against Amazon. But as long as they stay in denial and they go from one board meeting to another board meeting as I was being rude about them, they aren't going to get anywhere. And I want to talk tonight about those two different cultures, the Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos culture on one side and the stuff suit not naming any people in particular for the fears of libel and, uh, and slander on, on the other side. And, and, that, and I, if I get, do my job properly, I will give you an insight into those two different cultures, business cultures, and an insight also into how to decide which one you want to be, and then how to perceive value in the world where the Bezoses and the Elon Musks are, are, are changing the game. So that's the purpose of what I want to do in the next 20 minutes or so. What Ian didn't say when he talked about my background is that I, after IBM, I went to work for a company called Wang Labs. And Wang Labs was owned originally by a man called Dr. Wang, Chinese, left uh, China before the revolution, uh, went to America, couldn't go back because of the revolution, <coughs> built an enormous multi-billion dollar business as a result, the American dream, and so on. So I worked for a long time in a culture, both in this country and in America, which was half Chinese because the Chinese associates of Dr. Wang ran finance and R&D, and half not Chinese. So, I, so now in the 21st century, we all worry about the China threat and phenomenon and so on. Well, I've lived in a laboratory which was that where those two cultures came very much together. And um, there is a famous Chinese curse, let's see if I can do this properly, which is may you live in, in, uh, in interesting times. And Wang eventually went out of business. It's an interesting story for another time. But gosh, it was interesting. But it's a curse. And, and the point here is when things aren't interesting, you can predict what's happening next. When they get interesting, i.e. unpredictable, it's a curse. Well, I would argue that we don't live in interesting times, we live in disruptive times. And, and I want to talk a little bit about what I, I mean, it's obvious, but what I mean by disruption. Um, I'm gonna be slightly rude, but I'd be careful with my language. When I, I, my first job in the city, a friend I'd been at university with, who was a big chap in the city, said, Ken, old chap, I really will take you out for lunch and just give you a guide about what happens in the city. So this is now two hours of being patronized. However, he's a friend, and I don't know much about the city, so I said, well, that'd be jolly nice, Andrew. So we go to a restaurant in the city. He spends a lot of time fussing about the food and the wine, and then it starts. So I'm sitting there, I've now got one and a half hours to go, and I know he's going to tell me, let me tell you about the coffee shops in the 17th century, and this is how it all started, and so on. And I go, oh, Andrew, that's so interesting. And Andrew said the following. He said, Ken, what you need to know about the city is it's all about doing deals. Well, okay, I can see that point, but I'm slightly narrowing down what I thought the city was about, but I can see that. He said, and in every deal, he said, there are two kinds of people. I'm not going to use the words he used, but they began with F and ended with ers or es. He said, so you're either an F -E or an F E in every deal. And Ken, let me tell you, the most important thing is to know on every deal which of those two you are. 
Now, I have to say, 20 years in the city, that was the most useful advice, that you go barreling in optimistically to talk to somebody and to think, uh uh, I'm an E and not an er in this piece. <laughs> well, in this world of today, organizations, this university, John Lewis, Walmart, etc., are either going to be disrupted or they are going to disrupt. So, I, so the big message, first big message of tonight, is when you look at an organization, when you're thinking about working for them, whether you're thinking about investing in them, whether you're thinking about starting one, you need to decide, or am I a disruptor or a disruptee? If you're a disruptee, it doesn't mean you're going to be destroyed, but you have to behave quite differently than if you're a disruptor. And the one thing you can't afford to do if you're a disruptee is be complacent and say, it doesn't matter, they don't make any money or whatever it happens to be. It, if you're a disruptor and you're determined to tear down the system, it doesn't mean you'll be successful. So Elon Musk hasn't got to Mars yet. He hasn't actually got Tesla to be a sustainable business yet. But he is scaring the bejeebas out of the auto automobile industry and he's beginning to worry the space industry. He's a disruptor of, of, uh, of prime uh, real estate, as it were. And so, go to the next step. The, my point is that every sector Every industrial sector that exists today, including information technology, is being disrupted or is at risk of being disrupted by information technology. So again, when I started in business, if somebody left a hotel chain to start another hotel chain, they would do what they'd learned in the hotel chain, but slightly differently. So I've been doing posh hotels, I'll now do budget hotels. And I'll just scrimp and scape, but it's the, basically the same model. If you're in the automobile industry, you left an automobile company and you decided you'd do hand-built cars, but they were basically the same thing. So there was no disruption, there was just a continuation, an evolution of industry. Think back to your jobs, those of you who've been in employment for any length of time, think about people who started their own business in your sector. They will have done what everybody else in the sector did, but perhaps slightly different. Their business model might have been different or whatever. Think about Airbnb. They have completely transformed the lodging industry by saying, actually, why build a hotel? Why have all that real estate? Why have all that service model? Why do that? What people want to do is to move from A to B, stay somewhere nice, and then go away again without any obligation. That's what lodging is. And so we'll do it by using people's spare capacity homes. They've changed the lodging industry. Uber have changed the taxi industry, the ground transportation industry, and Amazon, of course, have done it spectacularly in retail. Even IT is being disrupted. So the cloud means I don't have to buy a machine to put into my office anymore, my on-premise, because I just log on to something and I pay by the minute as a utility instead of buying some great capital goods. So guess what? People like Dell have had to merge with EMC as a defensive move to deal with the fact that actually no one is buying, well, not nobody, but progressively people, less and less people are buying what they've been selling forever. For 30 years, they've been selling. So even the IT industry is being disrupted by IT, and every other industry is being disrupted by IT. We had a meeting in my office the other day with some agricultural people. They weren't farmers, they were manufacturers, you know, big companies doing agrochemicals and so on. And they're being disrupted because now the deployment of agrochemicals involves data, analysis, monitoring, satellites, it's all changing. And if all you do is put stuff in sacks and sell it to somebody, you are about to become a disruptee and not a disruptor. So the big question for everybody is, as I've said, which of those two things are you? To quote my friend Mr. Skinner, as he was. But my title was, Be Mad Not Calm. So let me talk about what I mean by that. Let's go back to Elon Musk. Elon Musk claims, and I have no reason to disbelieve him, I don't know him, I've not sat and interviewed him, I've only read this, but he claims to have had the intention of populating Mars when he was at university. He has started five or six successful businesses and one non-successful business to get to the stage that he's at today. Since university, he's had his sights set on populating <coughs> Mars, and that's what he wants his legacy to be. That kind of disruptor is focused on a mission. It's, if you know anybody who's ever walked to the South Pole, sailed across the Atlantic, rode across the Atlantic, climbed Everest, they're focused on this objective. And, and this obsession with an outturn, a, a life-changing outturn, is what differentiates one group of business people from the other. And I call them mission-addicted disruptors. So they're not just people doing something, they're chasing after an objective. And it's a high-order objective, and it's a world-changing objective. Now, it might be 
as one of my clients is, he just wants to change the way that people buy and sell things using their mobile phones. But he thinks the way Apple does it is nonsense. He thinks the way that WorldPay does it is nonsense, et cetera, et cetera. He thinks um, contactless is completely stupid and insecure, et cetera. He just wants to fix that. So his mission is to fix electronic payments. So it's not quite as noble, perhaps, as populating Mars, but that doesn't matter. He's obsessive about it. It's all he thinks about. So the mission addiction is a very important part, and I get my term mad from the mission addicted <coughs> disruptor. On the other side, you've got these organizations that I pejoratively read about before that just keep going at the same old cycle speed as ever, and I, and I call those change-averse line managers. They don't like things changing, which is obviously what change averse means, but they don't like things changing, and if you come up with a smart idea, they're... Uh, first inclination is to find out how to smother it rather than to uh, espouse it. They are disruptees. So the, my big message of tonight is you're a disruptor or a disruptee. If you're a disruptor, you're going to be mad. If you're not mad, it won't work because you're busy trying to be clever and changing business models, but you've not got that burning ambition. And if you are a change-averse line management cultured organization, these things will get you because they'll nip away at 5% here and 1% there, and over time you'll find your growth is impaired and then you start to shrink. The Walmart story. So I've got these two tribes, the mad tribe and the calm tribe. I want to spend a bit more time now talking about the mad people because tonight's about mad and not about calm. If you are an entrepreneur, and I won't ask anybody to put their hands up and be embarrassed about this, but if you're an entrepreneur, everybody is an irritation to you unless they're helping you achieve your objective. And most people are an irritation because most people aren't trying to help you achieve your objective. So entrepreneurs are universally, mad entrepreneurs, are universally, and in my experience, totally universally, uh, impatient, irritating people. In fact, most mad entrepreneurs are divorced or have been divorced, have high staff turnover, and are at war with their investors. If you're married to a mad entrepreneur, you say things like, well, okay, what's the excuse tonight? It's half past 11, the kids have been in bed for four hours. What was it this time? And your husband, partner, wife, partner says, yep, whatever, I'm really sorry, there's an issue in the office, I can't talk to you now, though. I've got to get on the phone and make a conference call. Is there anything to eat? And that tension there is, is, is potentially very corrosive. The staff say, you know what, boss, you came in on, well, they would never say it, but they think this, you came in on Monday and you said the most important thing that we could possibly do was X. It's now Wednesday and you've forgotten all about that and now the most important thing is Y. You're so quixotic, it's in my employment interest to wait until Friday and see what the big thing is for me to worry about over the weekend. So the staff don't get on with following the mission because they haven't understood the mission. And the investors, they're the angriest. They say things along the lines of, do you know what, I put my name on the block, I went to my investment committee, I got all that money for you, and you've done none of the things you said you were going to do, and I will make sure you never raise another penny in this town, city, country, planet, universe, or whatever it happens to be. Or if it's your own money, then the, the words are full of expletives. So those three groups of people struggle with mad entrepreneurs, and they think the mad entrepreneurs are just unfair, unreasonable, unsympathetic. If you're none of those constituents, then you're quite lucky, and just bear with me for the next, next bit that I want to talk about. Because actually, there is a method to the madness of the mad entrepreneur. And they are in a hurry. Elon Musk can see populating Mars. And he's, you know, he's in his 40s, he hasn't got forever, he's got to get on with doing that. And if you come along with an idea that doesn't help him accelerate the journey to populating Mars, you are in his way. If you come along and say, do you know what, Elon, last month you told me this, now you're telling me this different. He hasn't got time to explain why it's all coherent and consistent. You're in his way. And the Elon Musks of this world are destined to travel around something which I call the entrepreneur's cycle. You have an idea, you research the idea, you put a plan together to exploit the idea, you resource that plan, people, money, partners, whatever it happens to be, you implement the plan, and you discover that what you originally thought was a really good idea isn't quite right, and it needs to change. And so you change your idea, modify it, you do the research on the modified idea, you replan, you re-resource, you re-implement, and you discover, yes, it still isn't perfect, but it's getting better, and so you change it again. And you travel around that cycle at whatever speed you need to, maybe once a year, maybe once a quarter, maybe once a month, maybe once a week, maybe once a day, maybe twice a day, whatever it takes to keep going around. You don't keep banging your head against an idea that you now know doesn't work. 
But if you unpack that and, and you haven't spoken to somebody for a quarter and they say, but hang on, you said you were doing this and now you're doing that and they don't look similar, you haven't got time to explain that you've been around the cycle 22 times because you're busy going around the cycle. And so there has to be a way for the mad entrepreneur to be able to communicate to my three constituents, the, part, the loved ones, the staff, and, and, the, uh, and the investors, so that they can understand for themselves how one's been traveling around that cycle. So the metaphor I like to use is if you're traveling, if you ski, or if you cycle at speed, you're going down a hill at speed, and you have a pretty good idea, you want to get to the bottom, you know you want to get to that hut, restaurant, whatever, car park, whatever it happens to be, and you've got a pretty good idea of the route. I'm going to avoid the rock, I'm going to avoid the trees, I'm going to do stuff, and then you get on with it, and as you discover as you're going down the hill, events change, you course correct, etc., etc., until you get to the bottom. And there's no point when you've got to the bottom, somebody saying, oh, excuse me, but I thought you said you were going to go around the left-hand side of that tree and you went around the right-hand side of that tree. It's, there's, there's no point in that because it isn't the purpose of the exercise. If you travel on an airplane across the Atlantic, you don't get the plan, the route from the captain before you get on the plane and then mark it off as you go along. Oh, excuse me, you said you were going to be at 32,000 feet. That doesn't matter. As long as you land safely in New York and you're generally traveling the right direction until you get there, you're content. In business, that's not what we do. We have all these spreadsheets, and we say, but hang on, it's period two. Could you just explain why in period two, you didn't actually make the numbers year on year compared to the sun? Who cares? It's not the point. The point is, am I getting towards Mars? Am I getting towards the bottom of the hill? Am I getting towards New York? The mad entrepreneur says, I'm just going to race around this cycle until I either die or I get my mission accomplished. There isn't time to spend going back, explaining to everybody what happened. If the mission is understood, then the three constituents I spoke about can then participate by saying, well, excuse me, with, but with respect, I think there is a better way of doing whatever you're struggling to do at the moment, because I now buy into the mission. If they don't know what the mission is, that all they do is receive instructions and get frustrated and the things that I, the negative points that I described before. So for those of you who are entrepreneurs, you are destined to travel around and around my orange circle en route to achieving whatever your ambition is, whether it's for the business or whether it's, a bit, it's populating Mars, but Elon Musk has got to get Tesla to work to get the money to get to Mars. So that, his ambition is, is twofold in that context. So what does all that mean? What does all that mean if you are in business on either side of my, so the side I've been rude about, the calm side, or you're, or you're on the other side? Well, it's not all bad if you're John Lewis on the negative side, as I've been rather rude about them. It's not all bad if you're Ford Motor company, you do have some things going for you that the guy that wants to start the next online retail chain hasn't got. So let's talk about those for a little bit. And here it comes back to the, uh, the third important point of what I wanted to say. Many years ago, as in about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there were some big transactions happened in, in my world of IT that were inexplicable. The one that we'll do for tonight's illustration was IBM bought Lotus. Some of you might remember Lotus Notes. They bought Lotus and they paid three point, for memory now, $3.5 billion for a business that was going out of business. Lotus Notes was shrinking in terms of revenue. It was losing money. It had one product, Notes, that was still fairly popular and some other products to do with PCs that were completely dogs. So actually, all you had to do if you were IBM was wait and they'd have gone away. Yet IBM bought them and then carried on calling them Lotus and Lotus Notes, whereas all of IBM's acquisition history before had you buy something and you squeeze it into your products and you destroy everything that was there. And I thought, well, that's really stupid. IBM, which I, whom I used to love because I used to work for them, make, they, they don't make stupid decisions. So they saw something that we can't see when we look at the, the P&L, when we look at the balance sheet of that organization. What IBM saw, I would argue tonight, is they saw something that which, which we call at Restoration Partners the four pillars of value. And these are the bits between the value of the assets and then the value of the entity, the enterprise, the price that's paid. The difference between two young men and a team writing a virtual reality operating system that doesn't yet work and a billion dollars. What's the difference between those two? And the answer is, lies in the four pillars of value. They're quite simple. Quality of the people, quality of the offering, quality of the base, which is the marketplace, customers, access, distribution channels, and the quality of the brand. Now, IBM bought Lotus Notes because they bought the only team that could write what was called groupware in those days, the only team, so they paid a premium for the people. They bought the only groupware product that worked. IBM had tried to make one and it didn't work. Microsoft were trying to do one, it wasn't working. So they bought the only product that worked. 
They bought the biggest customer base, because Lotus Notes was ubiquitous at the time, so they bought base, and they kept the name Lotus Notes instead of calling IBM Notes or something else, because they bought the brand. So people offering base and brand. So think about a company that you know, your own company, for example, the one that you're dreaming of creating, or the one that you've created that you're now dreaming of building, and rank those four pillars, people offering base and brand, do it simply, there's a scientific way of doing this, but you don't need to do that. High, medium, low. As I've been rude about them, let's take John Lewis. So what do we think about John Lewis's people? Actually, let's not do John Lewis, that's how, because I have some very bad views about their people. Let's choose a random company X. What do we think about their people? What do you think, well, they, I just viscerally feel they're good people, they do well, they care about the customer, they think about the marketplace, etc., etc. So I'll, I'll give them medium. They're not the best, but I'll give them medium. What do I think about the thing that they're selling to me? Again, you can rank it low, medium, high. What do I think about their customer base, their distribution channels, and so on? Just viscerally, you can say, well, I rank it low, medium, or high, and their brand. So let's imagine you're a startup. You've got this really, you and your mate in the back bedroom have written some code, an application that does something that is going to transform the world when everybody's bought it. So you're the only people who know how to do that because you've invented it yourselves. So you're going to give yourselves a high score for people. It's the only thing that does whatever it is you've invented it doing in the world, and so you're going to give yourselves a high score for the offering. You haven't got any customers, so you're going to have to concede a low score for the base, and nobody's ever heard of you, and you're not even sure what the company's called, so you're going to have to concede it's a low score for the brand. So you've got two things out of four. You need to have all four, and they need to be high to get the best possible value, and that's quite a simple point. If you're, let's go back to being John Lewis again, rudely for a moment now, but if you're John Lewis and you look at the same thing, what have you got? Well, your people are people, so let's be kind, they're medium. There's nothing hugely special about a John Lewis shop assistant or manager compared to anybody else. My experience, they're not even that good, but that's going too far. In, term, in terms of the offering, well, they sell the same things, the same brands, it's broadly the same. So let's be nice, they're medium again. But they've got an enormous, unassailable base. The John Lewis customer base is deeply loyal, it buys from them for a long time, et cetera, et cetera, and they've got a very, very powerful brand. So they, they, let me say they're, let me be kind, they are low to medium on the first two and high on the other two. So if my two guys in the back bedroom have invented something which would help John Lewis become a disruptor and not a disruptee, it's sort of a no-brainer to say they and John Lewis should work together. Because then the four pillars works, because now we've got high, 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 and high. And the underlying thesis of what I wanted to say to you tonight is you're either mad or calm, but you don't have to get depressed if you're calm, because that's a machine that keeps on going and has a life that will, will outsee the people inside the organization. And if you're some razzy, excitable, phosphorus on water, buzzing about all over the place, innovator, disruptor, then you might burn out before you get anywhere because it takes 10 years to build yourself a base. It takes probably 15 years to build yourself a brand. The company that got half a billion dollars the other week is called Improbable, which proved to be, I'm sure, ironic at some point in its history, but it's called Improbable, but none of us had ever heard of it before they got the half billion. For them to build a brand, it's going to take a lot of money. Now, they've got a lot of money, but Uber has spent billions building the Uber brand, and it's taken years for them to do that. So the thesis tonight that I had is you must decide whether you're a disruptor or a disruptee. You then must decide whether you're going to be mad or you're going to be calm. Are you buzzing about around that cycle or are you in fact moving fairly slowly? And then when you've done that, the next step in this world where everybody is being disrupted is to find a complementary partner or partners who will compensate for the things you don't have. And my two circles there describe entrepreneurs, the mad people on one side, the established people on the other, those with the base and the brand, those with the people and the offering. And if that works properly, the calm can become converted to becoming mission addicted disruptors. So because you are a large, slow moving company with a low score on people and a low score on offering, doesn't mean you have to stay that way. It is possible to revivify a calm, slow, inertia driven company and to turn it into something that is, that is exciting. So I think in this time in the world, the world history, there is an unparalleled opportunity because the 
fact that it's technology that is transforming this model as I've described it, causing the disruption, the fact that technology is so accessible, it costs almost nothing to write the killer app it costs more to promote it in some, but it costs almost nothing to write the killer app and to get things moving. Whereas, again, 40 years ago, it cost 20, 30, 40 million dollars just to get started, to start a technology business. So now it costs almost nothing to get the killer app going. So you can be a disruptor with no resources at all. And if you're a large, momentum-driven, calm business, you can avoid being disrupted by partnering with disruptors and making the four pillars complementary model work. And if that's all right, that means that in fact, everybody can be mad and that will be a good thing. Thank you.